Thomas, it's my great pleasure to lead this uh, third morning introduction tutorial. It's really uh, nice to have you all in Warsaw, and I'm hoping to have an opportunity to discuss not only the ideas we'll be going to present during the tutorials, but also uh, your research. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it. So, as Michal said, we are trying to keep, during these introductory tutorials, we are trying to give a broad perspective on argumentation. So, um, my, uh, my work in the Center for Argument Technology, ArcTech, and Faculty of Law, University of Bielorussia, is focused on uh, argumentation, uh, dialogue, persuasion, in particular, arguments from authority, expert opinion, and computational ethos. So this is also what I'm going to discuss. However, at the very beginning, So, uh, we have the complex phenomenon of argumentation. This is the box in the middle. And the idea is to give you four basic perspectives, research perspectives, that will show you, that will show us how complex that phenomenon is and how complex and also interesting uh, argumentative structure and cognitive phenomena should or could be grasped when, you, when you're doing computational argumentation. So, uh, I don't think it's working. Philosophical and rhetorical perspective. 
So the idea, the basic idea is that this was the first thing uh, scientists, researchers, philosophers were doing. So Aristotle, two and a half thousand years ago, developed a theory of communication in which he uh, distinguished three basic components. Ethos, the character of the speaker, the position of the speaker, logos, argumentation, and pathos, emotions of the audience. And Aristotle claimed that these three are interrelated. And now I'm going to use these three notions in order to describe this philosophical angle on argumentation. Ethos, logos, and pathos. Okay? So let me start from logos because this is what basically philosophy <coughs> Philosophers and politicians have been doing for, for two millennia. And logos in communication, in argumentation theory, is basically related to argumentation structures and argumentation schemes. So, very briefly, there's a book uh, by uh, Douglas Watson, Chris Reed, and Fabrizio Massagno, Argumentation Schemes, and there's a theory of argumentation schemes. Argumentation theories distinguish at least 100 different argumentation schemes in order to uh, identify common patterns of argumentation in natural language discourse. So the idea is that uh, we have typical patterns of which some of them I will uh, try to briefly present. An example is argumentation scheme from the direct ad hominem argument. The direct ad hominem argument is a personal attack. So Walton describes this as in terms of distinguishing a character attack premise. A is the person of that character. And conclusion, A's argument should not be accepted. So during this introductory tutorial, I'm not going, of course, to discuss all the mm, all possible or even most typical argumentation schemes, but to show you, uh, but I'm just going to show you what these schemes are trying to grasp and what they basically cannot grasp. So uh, this is one example. Another one is argumentation scheme for the circumstantial ad hominem argument. And we have here uh, a premise, A advocates argument A, which has proposition A as its conclusion. We have a premise pointing to inconsistency. A is personally committed to the opposite of A. We have the credibility question in premise. A's credibility is uh, as a sincere person who believes in his own argument has been put in question. And conclusion, the credibility of A's argument, uh, of, uh, A's argument A is decreased or even destroyed. So as you can see, we have a logotic interpretation of what's going on in a discourse. We have common patterns of argument, arguments, and we are trying to uh, identify them in the discourse. Uh, another one is another scheme, it's argumentation scheme for the argument from expert opinion. We have two premises here. Major premise states that source E is an expert in subject domain S containing pro a given proposition. Minor premise, E asserts that proposition A is true or false. And we have a conclusion, A is true or false. So this is what logicians have been doing for decades, uh, describing argumentation from the logos perspective, argumentation structures. So let me now show you some problems with this approach. I'm not claiming this approach is not useful, it's <coughs> basic, truly important. However, uh, we can uh, make our approach a bit richer. In order to make it richer, uh, let, uh, let's move on to critical questions. So the argumentation scheme theory, uh, a part of this theory, uh, is um, uh, a set of critical questions. For instance, uh, here's a set of critical questions for evaluating arguments from expert opinion. So 
you, you have these, this argument, this scheme for argument from expert opinion, and then you have questions, critical questions that allow you to evaluate uh, a given instance of argument from expert opinion. You can, for instance, ask how credible is he as an expert source, or you can, uh, you can uh, ask whether, the last question, whether or not uh, is his assertion based on evidence, so you critically evaluate uh, arguments using critical questions. So here I just uh, I just like to show you that this approach is a very pre preliminary attempt at showing that critical questions are a source of a manifestation of a dialogical approach to argumentative pattern. So you have argumentative patterns and argumentation schemes showing that you question these uh, patterns. So you, you, you are trying to dialogically, in a way, evaluate uh, patterns of reasoning or instances of reasoning that belong to a certain pattern. However, this is not purely dialogical because you don't have this situation of discussion move. So, in order to make this characteristic more adequate, we need to add this discussion move. And this will be my next step. So, how to get beyond this inferential logotic approach to argumentation? One of the ideas is to show that dialogues create arguments. Some particular utterance in a dialogue may create argumentative structure. So this is uh, to show that argumentation is not abstract logical phenomenon, but it is deeply involved in dialogue. So in order to show that, we can say that a di direct ad hominem uh, as discussed previously, is a dialogue. Why? Because, for instance, you can have here, as discussed in Guzik and Reed, uh, an exchange of personal attacks, as you can see. You have an exchange of personal attacks. So, for instance, I can... Someone attacks me personally, and dialogically, I answer with the, using the same device a personal attack. And then you can see that many exchanges, as this one, consist of a dialogue exchange of uh, direct ad hominem attacks, right? Okay. Another thing is that the scheme I showed you earlier, circumstantial ad hominem, can also be interpreted as a dialogue move. So if someone is saying, so this is this is an example taken from the Hansa UK parliamentary debate report. If one of the uh, uh, if one of the uh, British Parliament MPs says, I find what he said today hard to reconcile with the normal meaning of tax avoidance. The answer is it's not inconsistent, and the response is I should have thought it was. So, circumstantial ad hominem is about inconsistency, and here you can see dialogue moves, dialogue moves that show you that there's an exchange of these inconsistency attacks and a defense, right? Uh, <coughs> another thing is uh, to show that an appeal to expert opinion, as discussed uh, a moment ago, it also consists, consists some elements of dialogue moves. So, for instance, uh, in law and sociology, we discuss some dialogue moves uh, about expert opinion. So, if uh, someone is uh, saying, so this is a legal box, here is a saying, you are not an expert in this subject, so you could not understand the evidence. This is an inappropriate argumentation move which plays a role of a blocker in a dialogue. So if someone is, so let, let us imagine that we, we cross-examine an expert in court. And uh, the expert uh, in 
instead of answering the question, says something like, I'm the expert here. You're not the expert, so you're not uh, eligible to ask the question. So this is an in inappropriate dialogue move. Uh, using expertise, but not in a rational way. So, as you can see, we have some elements of dialogue, but the question is, what theory have we got, what model, in order to grasp these dialogue phenomena in a more systematic way? Because we can see that this logos approach is not sufficient to grasp what is going on in dialogue, right? So let's see <laughs> that we have some dialogue moves. And here, this is this path, this, this dialogue path, which is not legitimate. You are not an expert, so you are immodest to ask. So this response is an indicator of, an, uh, of a fallacy which consists on an improper use of uh, expert opinion. Okay, so how to go beyond laws? So as we can see that, so this is the summary of this first part of the tutorial, that in natural language communication only some parts of an argumentation scheme are usually made explicit. And these, these explicit parts are dialogue moves. So maybe it's better or more adequate to describe some references to expert opinion, a covenant, and so on, as dialogue moves. Second, argumentation schemes are monological, so they are not fully capable of capturing these dialogue exchanges. And third, uh, thirdly, argumentation schemes for etopic argumentation reduce ethos support and attack to premise conclusion structures. What does it mean? <coughs> so ethos, as I said previously, is the best character of the speaker. And we can have uh, in argumentation scheme theory, there, there is something like etopic argumentation. But this etopic argumentation, like argument, uh, like ad hominem argument, as shown before, this etopic argumentation is reduced to premise conclusion structures. This means that ethos is reduced to logos, in a way. So how? to go beyond this in order to show that there are some interesting structures related to the character of the speaker which cannot be grasped by this logotic argumentation scheme. Okay? So, there are two possible research directions here. So, instead of reconstructing the implicit part of argumentation schemes, these explicit bits of dialogue can be interpreted as dialogue moves. And this, is, uh, this will be discussed in the second part of this uh, introductory tutorial devoted to dialectics of communication. Moreover, some of those dialogue moves support or attack other character or position also via emotion. This means that we can try to say more about ethos the character of the speaker, and pathos, emotions of the audience. And this part, this is the first part of the tutorial devoted to uh, the rhetoric of communication. So let me move on to the second part, dialectics of communication. So we have speaker's moves and we have intentions in the dialogue. This means that uh, we can try to uh, turn to this question about your theory or model of theoretical foundation. So this theoretical foundation can be found in Budinka and Rick who propose the inference anchoring theory which grasps not only inferential structures but also dialogue structures and speaker's intentions. So let us, let us uh, briefly look at this uh, exchange. Bob is saying P, will my saying Y P, Bob is saying Q. This is the idea is that Bob is making an argument here. And Wilma is challenging P in order to obtain a premise. Right? 
And this is the basic idea of the inference unproduced structure. So on the right hand side of the diagram, you have diopenes. Both set C, there's a diode transition from from your box set to a Wilma set, Wilma set likely, then both box answer is cute. So let me only show you that on the right now, on the right hand side of the diagram, we have diopenes. What's going on in the diode? This natural environment. And we know there's an argument. What's the argument? The argument is Q, therefore P. So this, this is what you have on the left hand side of the diagram. And now the question is what's the glue? What's the connection between the right hand side and the left hand side of the diagram? And the answer is that this glue, this connection, is, um, is um, communicative intention. So let us see. What's Box doing by saying P? He's assertive. What's Wilma doing by saying YP? She's challenging P. What's Bob doing by saying Q? Q. He's also assertive. But apart from asserting, he's doing something that's more. What, what's he doing? Also, he's not, he's not only assertive. He's saying Q in order to fulfill certain communicative goals. What's the goal? To argue, right? Well, so the procedure, this is the procedure of arguing. So, these two moves are interconnected via arguing. So this is why, as you can see, diodes create arguments. Diodes create arguments. So, this briefly discussed uh, stru structure of the uh, inference structure described by the inference argument, uh, the inference answering theory, will be discussed by Kasia Budzyńska tomorrow during her tutorial devoted to computational and linguistic perspectives on argumentation. So this is an introduction that uh, might be a starting point for understanding what Kasia will be saying. So uh, this computational aspect can be uh, defined uh, in terms of trying to mine some arguments from diodes using the theoretical foundation. So we have this TNQ structure, we have these important, these important communicative intentions, we have transitions, and we can try to mine certain structures from large, large scale um, natural language text. So what's most important here is argument. And we can, for us at least, during this tutorial, and we can try to uh, capture the certain structures <coughs> here. And this is, on the left hand side, you can just see the logical structure. This is the logical structure. This is how this logical structure is generated by diode moves. And here in the middle, you have communicative intentions. So this is the theoretical foundation we'll be referring to. So let me give you, instead of P's and Q's, let me give you a number of language examples. So uh, in the uh, Clinton-Trump head-to-head 2016 presidential debate, uh, we had an exchange, uh, many exchanges like this. So uh, Wallace asks uh, Trump, you support a national white prairie law. Why, sir? Trump's answer is, in Chicago, which uh, has the toughest gun laws in the United States, they have more gun violence than any other city. Uh, is Trump making an argument? How do you think? 
if you make me an argument? There's a why question and there's an answer. Is this an argument? Let's see. So this is this is the uh, argumentation map uh, done with the use of OVA online visualization of argument tool developed at the University of Dundee uh, Center for Argument Technology. And this map, as you can see, contains the structure I discussed a moment ago. So let's look at the right-hand side of the diagram. Wallet is asking, first, he's stating that Trump supports the national rights carry law. Then he's asking a why question. And here's, here's Trump's answer. And imagine now that you were watching uh, the uh, TV debate, but you were late. And you turned the TV on exactly in the moment when Trump was saying this. In Chicago, Chicago which has the toughest gun laws in the United States, they have more gun violence than any other city. You only hear this. On the basis of what you heard, you cannot say that Trump is making an argument, right? What's needed in order to see that he's making an argument? You have to see previous dialogue moves. So this, is, this answer is a part of the argument structure, but you cannot recognize it without seeing the dialogue structure. So this example can show us how important it is to, start, to, to see dialogue moves and show that it's really the case the dialogue moves create arguments. Okay? So, uh, this, is, uh, this was the second part of the uh, tutorial. And let's add some rhetorical aspects here. So, we have logos. We have uh, logos, namely argument structures and argumentation schemes. We have dialectical dialectical angle, namely dialogue moves. And what about rhetorics? So for, for rhetoricians, two really important aspects of communication of communication are ethos and pathos. The character of the speaker and emotions of the audience. So how can we add ethos and pathos to these characteristics. So, as you can see, we have three steps. Argumentation structures, then we added dialogue moves, and now how to add ethos and pathos to these characteristics. So, the first part of the tutorial is devoted to this rhetorical aspect. So, we have Trump and Clinton again, and what is ethos? Ethos is the, as I said, the character of the speaker. But what are ethotic structures? Ethotic structures are such communication structures that refer to speaker ethos. So in this type of a political debate, Trump can say that he is credible, trustworthy. So these, these would be utterances that strengthen his ethos. But he can also say that Hillary Clinton is not credible. This would be ethos attack. So this is what we mean by ethos <coughs> strategy. We, we can have either ethos attack or ethos support. Example. Good luck to read Grenell, our new ambassador to Germany. A great and talented guy. He will represent our country well. Clearly an ethos. Support. Another example, Crook Hillary Clinton is the worst and biggest loser of all time. Clearly, argument, uh, clearly ethos, attack. And if, if you'd like to describe political debates, you can see that they can be nicely uh, 
described as anisotic gay. A gay of ethos. So, ethos is quite important. But what about pathos? Pathos is important as well. Uh, because, as you can see, these expressions are also very emotional. So pathos is the game of emotions of the speaker. So we have, so ethos and pathos are tangled in a way. And this is quite interesting to see how to disentangle or describe in a systematic manner uh, these two aspects, ethos, and pathos in communication. Of course, not only in political debates, this is just an example field. Michał was mentioning the legal perspective. So you can also have ethos and pathos in legal communication, legal argumentation. Right? So this is just an example field. So uh, how to add to these dialogue structures I, I described on the second stage, how to add these exotic structures? So we have Bob and Wilma again, Bob says P, Wilma says YP, Bob says Q, but Bob is in a way legitimate to say, or is or is not legitimate to say P. So Bob has ethos, as you can see, it's added on the top of the diagram. And it's an appear, Bob has it. What does it mean? It means that Bob is credible enough or has a certain position in order to perform a successful speech act. Sometimes he's not legitimate. So I mentioned the argument from expert opinion. So if the expert says, you're not, in the, you're not the expert, so you shouldn't ask this question. So what is the expert doing? He's, he's trying to say that his interlocutor is not authorized to perform a speech act. So this is this is about ethos. And here, this is this is an example of how uh, we can add ethos to the uh, to this uh, argumentation map. Let me just give you a bunch of examples. So the last thing I'm going to uh, talk about is some chosen examples of ethos in order to give you an impression of uh, how important ethos is. Maybe a bit of pathos to see what kinds of emotions are brought in. And then I will quickly summarize. Okay? So we have some ethos types and only to show you the idea so we have uh, Hansa UK parliamentary debate record again, and we have an exchange between. Uh, so we have we have two two very examples here. So Mr. Moore said, uh, "I bow to my honourable friend's <coughs> English past and case knowledge of these matters." Another example example is Mr. Forsyth said, "When the honourable gentleman was a member for part." of my constituency, he fled the he because he was scared. So clearly the first example is the uh, ethos support, and the second one is ethos uh, attack. But there are also some types of ethos support and attack. So you can, uh, as, as, you can as you can see, we, we can have a certain specific type of ethos namely arguments from practical wisdom because we have linguistic skills that show you that distinguished past and case knowledge indicates practical wisdom. And for instance, Aristotle was writing of various uh, components of ethos and he mentions practical wisdom as one of these components or ethos types. <coughs> and what, ab what about the next example? Someone was scared that he would lose. This is a conflict in argumentation, but it's a certain type of conflict. It's conflict from moral virtue, because moral virtue is attacked here. It's not about attacking a practical wisdom. It's about attacking morality here. Okay? So in order just to 
just, just to give you an idea, it's not only the case that we have an utopic game between participants of, for instance, uh, political, uh, political debates. Uh, we have also various types of issues which can be addressed. So this complexity is very interesting, but also difficult to grasp computationally. But there are, there are attempts to use the influence anchoring theory I mentioned to provide uh, a more robust and systematic approach also to grasp ethos and to mine ethotic structures from uh, large, big, big uh, data sets of natural language text. Okay. So, I guess this is, uh, this is what I wanted to say about ethos. Let me just tell you the, uh, maybe, maybe just one thing. So, if uh, you, if you imagine uh, argumentation um, structure described by online visualization of argument tools. We can see, you can see that this is a representation of ethos support and below is a representation of an ethos attack. What's the idea? So let me discuss it on this, this example. We have Allocution, so something that has been said in the diary. This allocution has a propositional content. And this propositional content attacks someone's ethos. And it doesn't have to be ethos of the uh, particular person or speaker. It can be also ethos of, institution, of an institution or of a group of people, a party, political party. Here we have an ethos of government, which is attacked. So you can ethotically play an ethotic game not only with regard to individuals, but also with regard to institutions and groups of people, which makes this uh, very interesting, but also quite complex, right? So uh, this is a very short story about adding ethos to this characteristic. So let me conclude. So in order to, in order to conclude, <coughs> I didn't mention the notion of rationality yet. But if we discuss these three uh, areas, argumentation, theme, elements of philosophy of language, which was the uh, second part devoted to the direct move, and elements of rhetoric. An important question is about what argumentation schemes are rational, or, or uh, what, what, what argumentation structures are rational, which of them are not. An important question is also what dialogue tools are rational or reasonable, which of them are not. And the third question is, what rhetorical devices used in natural language communication are rational or reasonable? Which of them are not? So uh, let me leave you with this question, but this rationality, uh, this aspect of rationality is quite interesting for us, and uh, it will be brought in uh, other introductory tutorials, but there's a, an important question about what communication structures are rational, which of them are not. Okay? And the second, uh, this is the summary in regards to the subject matter of inquiry. But I would also like to summarize the method. So, in order to present um, the usefulness of philosophy and rhetorics in uh, doing computational argumentation, we can just say very generally that 
Philosophy and rhetoric allows us to obtain a coherent ecosystem of philosophical rhetorical devices that can be applied in computational academia, such as argument mining, computational linguistics, because they can give us a nice insight, a theoretical foundation to the structures we want to mine without having uh, an idea of what we are exactly mining and without being aware of how complex structures we obtain, argument mining would be very shallow. And we <coughs> don't want to do this. We want rather to have an in-depth insight into uh, what's going on in argumentation and a deeper in this deeper insight may allow us to do a really good argument mining job. Okay? The second thing is that these tools may allow us to make sense of large-scale argumentative texts, such as Hungarian parliamentary debate records or um, U.S. presidential debates, or legal arguments. And last, there are different communication genres, such as political debates, argumentation in the courtroom, citizen dialogues, negotiations, mediations, and so on and so forth. And this is an idea of giving you a brief description of rhetoric, of philosophical and rhetorical tools that are able to obtain a deeper insight into these different communication genres as a sort of a universal tool. This universal tool is, for instance, the influence Anthony theory I described uh, very briefly. Okay? So this is basically it. Here you have some selected references about uh, about ethos, about online visualization of arguments, about dialogical forms of argumentation, and uh, about um, some attempts to uh, apply rhetorical rhetorical devices uh, to argument mining. And for further reading, this general further reading, uh, so Aristotle is quite uh, important as we know. However. The idea is that uh, his insights into communication are really used now, recently used uh, for argument mining, which is kind of a nice connection that uh, we have the ancient theory, which can be used in computational argumentation nowadays. <coughs> okay. uh, the book I mentioned about argumentation schemes and the general handbook for argumentation theory where you can, where you can find various approaches to argumentation, philosophical and rhetorical ones. Okay? Thank you very much. Over to Michal, who will discuss the second part of uh, the morning tutorial will be devoted to uh, specifically to the legal angles. Thank you.